Hi, welcome. A lot of you. So we're here to talk to you today about some of our scaling and deploying fun of Neutron at Rackspace and kind of some of the things we ran into, some of the things we think need to get improved. Um, yeah. So let's get started. Um, so right now, Rackspace is we're still fairly early in our deployment. Um, we've done about half the DCs. Uh, we'll continue the other half when we get back from the summit. Um, but we're kind of moving from you know, early versions of Quantum and Melange, uh, moving them full into Neutron. And so primarily where we want to take the focus of this talk is kind of uh, the interaction between Nova and Neutron and some of those things that can kind of get out of control uh, when you operate at a big scale. So when we talk about scale, we're talking about tens of thousands of compute nodes, uh, hundreds of thousands of instances, and most of those instances on two or more networks. So that's a lot of calls that can come into Neutron. And so when we took our approach towards what we needed to deploy Neutron to and what we needed to achieve with it, we had a couple main criteria that we had to do. Um, obviously, anytime you replace a service, we need to make sure that everything we are already using, kind of those same APIs, needs to be in sure it still works. Um, we also really wanted Neutron to start being now the authoritative source for all network data in our public cloud. Um, so, you know, as we have different things below it, it's the ultimate state um, controlling that. Um, also, if we're getting rid of Melange, we need Neutron now to also be able to take care of our IPAM um, in an open source fashion. So, also, Rackspace, we have a lot of different types of networks. We have overlay, bridge ports, and coming up we're going to have containers and a lot of other different types of things that Neutron's going to be plugging in. So we needed a very modular back end so that um, no matter what network you're plugging into, Neutron has a driver that can basically orchestrate that. Um, that basically allows us then, as all these new products and our wide portfolio kind of gets integrated into Neutron, we have an easy way to bring new products in and it's much more upstream. Um, so what, what would end up coming out of those requirements is Quark. Um, basically, it's a, an open source plugin that we wrote in-house um, for the Neutron V2 API. Uh, it also comes along with all the IPAM that we needed to be able to kind of keep track of all the IP addresses within our public clouds. Um, we needed a couple things also to be able to orchestrate and to achieve the conversion to Neutron. So along with the Quark plugin that runs on Neutron, uh, we also needed a database migration. Um, to be able to take that data out of Quantum and Melange, aggregate that, and put it into our Quark plugin. Um, also, Upstream generally has, you know, one way of you know, viewing what the API should do, and sometimes Rackspace's business requirements require that we do something slightly different, and we don't want to keep trying to go to Upstream to take every one of the little niche case that we need, so we implemented a Waffle House stack, or what we call our middlewares, um, to be able to kind of tweak some of those business requirements, um, but still maintain the regular Neutron API. So when it comes to what we actually set up and deployed, um, it's a, generally a three tiers of things. So up in front, that's taking those first API requests, our load balancers. Um, those are you know doing our health monitoring of the API nodes, directing those to request to the active nodes. Um, we actually have quite a few API nodes these scale at horizontally, um, anywhere from you know two to eight, depending on the size of the DC and the scale that 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 DC needs to uh, achieve. And those then run our Quark plugins on you know, underneath that API node, and then our Waffle House kind of in the API stack. Um, and then we kind of borrowed, you know, from a lot of what we use, already do with a lot of our other Nova services, and that we kind of have playbooks already to build up, um, you know, very HA um, HA built uh, databases, to where we have CoroSync, PaceMaker, Stoneth to be able to kind of very quickly respond to any kind of outages along the database. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Justin, who's going to talk a little bit more about our Waffle House implementation and kind of what we can achieve with that. Hi, everyone. I don't know what's more comfortable, standing or sitting in those chairs. They're pretty terrible. Um, well, Waffle House, as you mentioned before, was a way for us to have our own specific requirements without having to push things upstream. Uh, these requirements are very, very specific, and they probably wouldn't make sense for upstream. And it helps us to prevent us from having uh, differences from upstream code, so we don't have to constantly merge them in during our deploy process and then deal with conflicts. That's terrible. Uh, and we feel that upstream's efforts would probably be better for the uh, to help the broader community instead of just dealing with all these nitpicky tiny tiny things. 
Um, at, at, at Rackspace, we have a, we kind of jokingly call it like the API mullet. It's a business logic in the front and a party in the back. Um, it's, it, it really does, uh, it helps with a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it really uh, it really helps with the dealing with the business logic for a company, uh, any company really, and but it does allow us to do all the stuff we got to do in the back end. Um, a very basic example, and I have like two or three examples of what Waffle House does. And by the way, this is an open source project that you can go ahead and freely put in front of any Neutron or Nova uh, environment. Um, a request will come in, and just like normal middleware pipe filter model, it'll hit the Waffle House middlewares. And those are called waffles, by the way, the Waffle House middlewares, waffles. Um, so it, the request hits the first waffle, and what we want to check is to make sure that this one, for this example, is that does the request have a particular UUID in it? It could be a network ID, it could be a port ID, it doesn't matter. Um, since it is residing with the request, it does have access to the whole body, so you can introspect the body and you can learn whatever you need to learn from that. Um, the other thing you could check is, is to see if the request violates policy, uh, such as you don't want a person to have a particular um, CIDR, a very specific CIDR, like slash something, a, a random number that you don't want people to have. Or it could be IP policies, for instance. Um, or, for instance, what if Quark, our plugin, uh, wants to have an additional piece of information that Neutron doesn't provide? So Neutron doesn't provide this piece of information to Nova, I mean to Neutron. Nova doesn't provide this information to Neutron normally. So using this, we could make this waffle actually insert that new information, either by querying some external database be it Keystone, or it could be Nova again. It can query Nova again for more information, and then it'll just pass it through as if nothing happened. So Neutron is none the wiser. And then it'll go through, and it'll do its job. Uh, another thing that can happen uh, is called routing. For instance, uh, Keystone has roles, so you can apply a role to any of one of your tenants. If there are certain tenants you want to do very specific things with, uh, such as you don't want that tenant to ha you want you want to enforce that this tenant has these particular two networks, service net, public net, for instance, and then some additional networks for your own business logic, uh, you can use this particular routing waffle, which will introspect the role from the headers or from the context, it will then pick a different WSGI path. If they aren't a part of that particular role, it'll just go normally like nothing happened. But if they are a part of that particular role, it will then just insert these other waffles in front of them and then it allows you to do more checks. And this is very helpful because this doesn't change Neutron at all. Uh, and Nova is really not, doesn't know anything about it either. So it's, it's very quick and very easy to debug, actually. The reason why we're used, we use Waffle House uh, primarily, the first reason why we did it, was because there were a lot of calls to Keystone whenever Nova and Neutron were interacting. Before, when we had Melange and Quantum, none of those calls were ever reauthorizing or contacting Keystone or Identity. Um, but then when we went to Neutron, Neutron by default is like, hey, you need to re-auth all the things. So every single request would be like, oh, is this token valid? Yeah, okay. And then it would hit Keystone again. And given the amount of traffic we had and the amount of info cache updates, which Andy will hit later, uh, it turned out to be debilitating. Um, what we did is that we added no auth support to Neutron, which it already had, kinda. Uh, but using Waffle House, we were able to actually make it work. So our Nova is working with normal Keystone authentication, and then Nova, uh, Neutron on the other side has no auth. So every single request is just perfectly not authed. The API request will come in with the X forwarded for header. It'll hit the Neutron API with Waffle House, and it'll do a pointer query on the, on the original requester to the DNS server, and it will return. And if that particular host name was a part of our configured uh, trusted domains, then what we'll do is an additional step where we'll make sure that that particular address record is the real original requester. Um, uh, mail servers do this from the past for a long, long time. So this is pretty normal. So by doing this, we at least know that this request, which is going through no auth, is coming from a trusted source.
it'll then, uh, this may sound a little complicated, but this is the way that you would configure such a thing. At the top is the normal composite and the API paste, and all of this Waffle House junk is happening inside of API paste. So you can go ahead and deploy it with Puppet or Ansible, whatever you need to do. So you have the normal uh, composite where it says no auth, and the no auth keystone strategy that we're using has the DNS filter uh, portion right at the front. And you can see that we took out the auth token and the keystone context for our no auth. So we're no longer using those middlewares as provided by OpenStack. And then the configuration for the DNS filter is right below. And our whitelist is a space separated list of domains. And you can see that it says enabled equals true because all of the Waffle House things are feature toggled off by default. So you can install it and it will not affect your environment until you explicitly enable them. So it is relatively safe. And you can turn it off and on by changing the, uh, that particular flag. And in addition to the, uh, the auth problems, we also had a lot of other call volume issues, which Andy will talk about now. Hey. So here's a picture of one of our deployment nights. The green is the call volume that we had pre-deployment. The two vertical bars are the start and finish of the deployment. And the red is the number of calls to Neutron after the deployment. We had nearly triple the call volume just by turning Neutron on. So this was a big problem. Our API workers were overloaded. So we had to decide, we had to really dig deep down and kind of see where is all this coming from. And it turns out it's the info cache updates from Nova. Almost 100% of these requests are those info cache calls. So really quickly, an info cache is Nova's view of the network model. Uh, so Nova can respond really quickly to requests, uh, like let's say a server list, right? and it returns the network info from that, it doesn't want to make a call all the way to Neutron to service that request, so it keeps its own copy of the network information there. This cache is refreshed on any operation that goes out to Neutron, so if you add an interface, remove an interface, add an IP, floating IP, whatever, the cache gets refreshed from the Nova side. And we really would like to see a callback system uh, for this kind of thing, but uh, these updates, they happen a, a ton. They happen on Nova compute restarts, which can be very interesting if you're doing a restart of several thousand of these at once. You can have a big stampede of these requests coming in as well. They also happen uh, by default every minute or every heal instance info cache interval. Uh, and this is six calls to Neutron per port. So these things were crippling our API nodes. Turns out, uh, we just set the value to zero. We don't have these updates happening anymore. There is a little bit of risk with the consistency of them, but since any networking operation is going to refresh that cache anyway, it's been fine for us in production to just have that at zero and it completely reduced our call volume. Oh, and speaking of cache updates, there is some issues around that with Nova cells. Um, this is just kind of a, a graph of our global sales workers, uh, RabbitMQ, uh, after th that deployment that we saw. And um, let's say the messages that were coming into that queue were coming in at a rate faster than it, they can be consumed. This was causing all kinds of chaos for us. Builds were being stuck. They would be issued, they would be building, but they would never quite go active because that requires the message to go back up to that global queue. So uh, for an idea of context, our normal kind of fluctuation in this graph wouldn't even show up here. Um, this was just exponentially larger in terms of message volume. We found this during a deployment and we sent this patch upstream, but we since disabled the healing of info cache updates anyway. So we're double safe from that, I guess. Kind of the things that we need as operators for uh, Nova and Neutron to work at the scale that we have uh, quickly is a callback system. The periodic update uh, just didn't really seem to work for us at the scale that we're at. 
Um, we'd also enjoy benefits of having a read-only slave for some calls that would be read-only. Some of that needs to be worked on in our plugin specifically, but I think the Neutron project itself could benefit from that as well. And uh, Neutron does work with cells, but it's it's not something that cells is cells isn't like native to Neutron. We only have one collection of Neutron workers. We don't have a collection of Neutron workers per cell. Right? So we would really like to see cells and Neutron work together so that we can kind of segment a lot of this load that we have to deal with. And yes, we would like to have fewer calls that do more. So building my instance, getting my ports and my addresses and all of this stuff, I would really like it to just be one call for all of the networks that I'm going to need instead of a back and forth that says, okay, what do I have? Oh, here, here it is. Okay, here's the ports that I can do. Here's what I want. It's a little bit too chatty for the scale that we're at, so we would just like to have more calls, or sorry, fewer calls that do more. So uh, what's next for us at Rackspace specifically? Uh, we're looking to publicly expose Neutron later this year. We're also, uh, Amir on our team is also doing uh, blueprints in the community for security groups with OBS. So we're really excited about that. And then here's some links to our patches that we've submitted that may be particularly relevant for other implementers. Blueprints that we're working on specifically around the callback system that I mentioned earlier, the OBS firewall driver. Uh, we also have links here to Waffle House, which will point you to the Waffle House middlewares that we use for Nova, and the Waffle House middlewares that we use for Neutron. And then we've also linked our Quark Neutron plugin, which handles our IPAM that these guys mentioned earlier. Thanks. Uh, any questions you guys have? See if you could direct it to the microphone. Do you think the current bulk updates supported uh, can be used in place of what you're doing for multiple updates which you mentioned right now? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the, that mic was really, really quiet. I, did, I couldn't hear bulk, it. Bulk updates, how, uh, uh, how effective is bulk updates for uh, NOAA, and neutron as compared to what you have put is there any um, any attempts on your parts to use that well the, the i think i believe the problem wasn't the fact that we couldn't make many ports at the same time the problem was specifically that it, it was a it was a bunch of steps. Nova doesn't particularly do it already, um, and it was a lot of questions. It was a question answer conversation between Nova and Neutron, and not just say Nova allocate for instance with all the information to Neutron. So if Neutron had say allocate for instance, that would work great, versus Nova calling allocate for instance and doing all the Neutron calls one by one by one, which. It has to do because, you know, it doesn't know the network yet. And at this cell level, uh, what is that is not there in specific uh, cell to neut NOAA, neutron, NOAA, you meant? What, what is missing in there? Cell interaction with neutron. So we can't have a neut uh, neutron node per cell. We break up our deployments into several different cells per region. And we can't have a neutron instance per cell and then a one that is above the region that the cells replicate up to. That's not supported right now. It doesn't exist in neutron. But that would help us with some of our scale issues that we have. So current support for region which is being introduced, do you think that will help? Our so we have to point all of our cells to a bank of neutron servers now instead of logically segmenting them out. Okay. Okay. Good. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, so there was a good presentation from eBay yesterday about similar problems with neutron at scale. And they mentioned the healing interval, which they had to tune down as well. They also mentioned uh, keystone calls for, for, and they went to PKI for that. Uh, how did you guys find the keystone volume? Uh, well, the keystone volume was terrible um, but the uh, what we did instead of uh, trying to change I 
But what we did is we switched to no off right. between the the services, and Waffle House was the way that we performed that without changing a lot of code. Uh, all it appears that OpenStack works great as Keystone, and, or it works great as no off. It doesn't appear to work great as kind of both, and that's where the Waffle the Waffle House filter comes in because it creates the context for you. Because when you're in no auth, you don't really have a, a good context to work with. And it also inserts some of the information that's missing, such as the roles which we use for to make some decisions. So you did do Keystone to Nova though, right? You're, but you just turned it off from Nova to Neutron? So right. Uh, Nova is our main consumer of Neutron. Mm -hmm. And um, we just turn that off between those com modes of communication. We did kind of a operational readiness thing and we noticed this call volume and then we kind of extrapolated that to scale and said, oh my gosh, we've got to do something about this. Okay, thanks. It also might be worth mentioning on that point that we're still into where Neutron right now is only servicing the internal stuff. So we're only servicing the computes, nothing directly from consumers or from customers. So that when we actually publicly expose, that will be nodes that will be running the full auth stack. But so with Waffle House, would you characterize it as like a framework? Because it seems like at its core you're just adding filters to sort of the you know WSGI uh, what, what exactly is Waffle House a framework to kind of chain those together on top of what you already get out of API, uh, the pace? Uh, to be honest, it really is just a collection of filters. It is a pipe and filter model, very, very basic. Uh, each one of the waffles, the filters, uh, stands alone. Uh, there, it, there is a, a ten, uh, uh, there's recommendations in the Waffle House code, I guess, to not assume that another filter exists. Some of them have to exist, such as the routing. Uh, but otherwise, they're very small. Most of them are less than 50 lines, very easy to test, and it, it's just a collection. And all of them have been stripped of all of our specifics, so anyone can use them, and we really do wish that it becomes a, a collective place where everyone can have these really strange business logic-y things and just collect, put them in that one place. And then we can all share without having to bloat the infrastructure such as Nova or Neutron with these weird requirements. Right. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay. It's a good presentation. And we also said yesterday our, you know, <coughs> the same issues what we faced at eBay, my team, uh, uh, did yesterday. So uh, I'm just asking how you guys are testing before you upgrade your environment because do you have a huge lab or you use your cloud itself to test all the upgrades and uh, how do you guys do that? So, so we get to write on, you know, Rackspace as a whole has a pretty big, uh, you know, CI, CD environment so that we go through dev, QE, um, and we've actually got some very, very talented QE devs that have written a lot of our tests to do a lot of the scale and break testing. So, you know, we emulated all of the info cache updates, kind of just seeing where breaking points were, same with the API volumes, those at the same time, and a lot of those kind of tests. And we've got pretty much like a, a you know, fairly big, you know, QE and integration testing environment where we can do those kind of sort of tests. We also went through, I mentioned it a little earlier, we went through a kind of a operational readiness exercise for this. And in that exercise, we identified some metrics that we would watch in our smaller pre-prod environments and kind of look for abnormalities and jumps on those to be able to pinpoint some of these bottlenecks, some of these kind of hot zones of the code to help us make these decisions to make it work at scale. So is it open sourced anywhere? You are the infrastructure. How you guys are, uh, you know, what are the different test tools that you have to run in your performance lab? Do you guys have uh, that open sourced or it's internal? The 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 yeah. <laughs> so for uh, testing, uh, getting ready for this uh, deployment, Essentially, we, we did two, uh, two major efforts to, to test. One was a functional test, which is equivalent yeah. to what uh, is done upstream with uh, Tempest. With, uh, Tempest. We, we have our own uh, uh, functional testing uh, harness, but it's essentially more or less the same thing that, that it's done upstream for, um, for, with uh, Tempest. For the performance side of this, we have a, we have a, a harness that we call a performance testing as a service, sure. and essentially what that's that's a uh, you can think of this as a, a 
REST request engine, uh -huh. and essentially we, we, write, we write a script. We deploy that script to a number of agents, and with those agents we can simulate any number of users, let's say a thousand users. Sure. And, um, and that's how we create load to the test. We, we, we created uh, three uh, uh, load tests. One was a basic uh, crowd operations for sure. ports, subnets, and, and, and uh, networks. We have another um, uh, test that simulates computes, compute nodes mm -hmm. during the info cache up update cycle. Sure. So we, we, we simulated uh, loads of uh, 100, 500, 1,000 computes uh, uh, with a, a number of uh, simulated instances okay. and updating the info cache periodically every minute of, as okay. they, they mentioned. And the third test that, that we, load test that we are running against the, the, the system is an, an IPAM test. Okay. So is it open source or it's internal tools that you use? It's, uh, I'm not sure if it's open source, but uh, if you talk to me later, uh, we, we, can, uh, we can discuss it. Yeah, yes. I barely need it. I'll talk to you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Miguel. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you guys are running multiple uh, Neutron instances in your deployment, right? So, yes. So how are they synchronized? Uh, is there a mechanism to synchronize or it's not required? So, so luckily, that's one of the big, big benefits of moving to the Neutron V2 is everything happens kind of uh, transactionally. So we can actually scale these out horizontally and not worry quite as much about um, the sequence of things happening. Um, anything else? We built a lot of transactions into Quark. Uh, yeah, and then that's a, quite a bit of what went into Quark was to make sure that those transactions happened very cleanly across you know, several worker nodes. Um, yeah, plug in. But yeah, that's... Kind of what the plugin does. You feel free to check it out. I'm, I'm just wondering on the on almost the other side of the the network performance itself. How did you ensure that the actual performance of the network was going to either stay the same? I'm oh, sorry. The uh, yeah the network performance. Um, so I mean, most of Neutron is about the orchestration of the configuration. Of it. Yeah, yeah. The performance itself, uh, whole well, a lot of the same team, but that's more a derivative of like OVS and the flow orchestration of that, which isn't changing by switching to okay, Neutron. Okay, you've been changing that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, you mentioned previously that uh, the security application was going to move forward. At the same time, you said that you're going to make Neutron available publicly and later on the second year. Are you going to deal with that application? So his question was around, we've split up, obviously, we've got no auth for our internal nodes, and then eventually we're going to go back to publicly exposed and actually need to do the full auth. And so how do we kind of deal with that? Um, those will be separate nodes. <laughs> so we'll have a different pool to handle the customer load versus the internal load of the actual scale of the cloud. We, we kind of benefit inside at Rackspace that we have these kind of, um, all of our infrastructure that generally controls our public cloud goes in another cloud. And so we can dynamically spin up the resources that we need um, to be able to build out those sort of things. Anything else? It's got to be something. Both. Put oh, Mike, Mike, please. So, what's your lead time to uh, you know take the code from upstream and then going and deploying in production? I mean, we we pull down upstream daily. Okay. So, and then it's you know, going through then our build process, the I, there's been a couple talks in the house of kind of a, what Rackspace's approach to that is, but. I think uh, what's running now is based on a release candidate for Icehouse. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well. All right. Well, thank you all very much. <laughs>